Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. Uh, we thank you that uh, we know that you are Lord over this day. And because of that, uh, we yield our life to you. We submit to you. And so now, God, we ask you through the power of your Holy Spirit to open up the, the eyes of our hearts that we can see you, God. Would you take the blinders off of us so that we can see who you are? We thank you for the gift uh, of eternal life through faith in your Son. And we thank you that he did what we should have done but couldn't do. And so, Lord, we place all our hope and all our faith in your Son this morning. And we pray this in all things in the powerful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen. Well, good morning. It is so good to see you. Um, man, last week was wonderful, fantastic. Um, but it was later in the morning, so you guys were a little bit more awake. Um, and uh, we, we, we would all agree that to be true. But And I'm just so thankful for last week. And I uh, feel like um, with the Lord giving us vision of where we want to be, uh, who do we want to be as a church and where we're going, uh, I could not be more excited about what the Lord's doing here at this family of faith and uh, the idea of making much of Jesus. Uh, because we know that's where hope's found. We, that's where new life is found. That's where eternal life is found in Jesus. And so we just want to make much of Him. And through this process, one of the things we wanted to do for you, we wanted to give you something that was worth giving your life to. And, and we believe making much of Jesus, making disciples who take the gospel to our neighbors and the nations for the glory of God was something worth giving your life to. Like We, we believe that to be true. And, and so we wanted to give you something and say, hey, this is, you can give your life to this. We as a church can, can give our life to this. And I want to give my life to that. I want my life to count for eternity. And it can only count for eternity if I make much of him. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. We can do many things, but if we want to do anything of eternal significance, we have to do it in the name of Jesus. And so that's where we're going, and that's where we're heading as a church, and I'm excited about that. And one of the things we mentioned was we want to make much of Jesus by being and making disciples who do what? I, who take the gospel to our neighbors and the nations. And so just, we, well, I told you this week, I'm going to give you something uh, that you can stick in your, your toolbox. Um, what is the gospel? We, we hear it constantly. It's kind of church lingo, right? Uh, the gospel. But what I want us to do the next three weeks is kind of give you a picture of what that is biblically. You know, the Bible describes it in such a way to where, hey, we can, we can take this with us, right? We, we believe it ourselves, and so we boast in it. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, he says, I boast in nothing else than Jesus Christ and him crucified. So like, I want to boast in the gospel, but I, but I want to know, and I want you to know what that is, right? And what that means for, for you and I. And so we're, we're going to be in a series for the next three weeks called This Changes Everything because the gospel does change everything. Uh, it changes you and me, changes everything. And so I want to give you something that you can take with you. When you leave these doors and say, and I, I got a firm grasp of what it means by taking the gospel to my neighbors and nations because I know I feel comfortable in what I'm actually taking. Um, you know, one of the things about uh, Vince Lombardi when he was a coach, what he would always do with his football players, he would show them uh, before they did anything, before they talked to X's and O's, he would take them out in the field and he would say, men, this is a football field. And he would take them to the lines of the field and say, this is inbounds, this is out of bounds. He would take them to uh, an end of the football field and say, this is a touchdown and this is where we win games. And then he would grab a football and say, men, this is a football. Can you imagine being a professional football player? Well, what he was doing, and I believe what Martin Luther said, Martin Luther said, to progress in the Christian life, we have to begin again. And so the idea of just being refreshed, and listen, the foundational things are the important things. And so that's what we're doing today. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you, hey, this is the gospel. This is what you root your life in. Paul said, he said, I, he said, what's most important, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, most important. But there, there are many things that are important, he says, but this is of most important. And he said that Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and then raised to life. Like that is the most important thing. He also says in 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, he says, I didn't come to you with uh, to speech of wisdom or... Uh, he said, I came to you with Jesus Christ and him what? And him crucified. So he said, this is what we need. 
church, is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Um, we're going to let Paul kind of unpack what this means for us. Um, and today we're going to do it, the way we're going to break it up is, uh, today we're going to look at substitution and justification. Um, those, are thir- those are terms in the Bible that the Bible uses to describe what Jesus has done for us in our place. And so what we're going to discuss today is the idea of substitution, Jesus in my place, justification, how I'm legally declared right before God. And then next week we'll look at uh, sanctification, right? The releasing us from the power of sin. And so uh, let's, let's look at what Paul is saying here in uh, Romans chapter 3. Let's start in verse 21. Paul says this, he says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed attested by the law and the prophets. So apart from the law, he says in verse 22, the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no distinction, he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I feel like that's a familiar passage that we know. Uh, We we can recite that. But then he says in verse 24, which makes this good news. So it's kind of bad news, right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But here's what makes the gospel good. Because then he says in verse 24, they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's good stuff. And then he says in verse 25, God presented him as an atoning sacrifice in his blood received through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint God passed over the sins previously committed. Verse 26, God presented him to to demonstrate the righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. Man, declare you righteous in the sight of God in Jesus. And then in verse 27, then where is boasting? It is excluded by what kind of law? By what of one of works? He says, no, on the contrary, by a law of faith. For we conclude that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Man, There is some, just in a few sentences, Paul has just blown my mind. Like He he has painted the picture of the gospel for us in such a beautiful way, man, that I believe that if we would just see it and just believe it and build our life on it, listen, it will change your life. It will change your life. Paul said in Romans 1.16, right? So the book of Romans you got the greatest chapter in the Bible, right? Romans 8. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But before that, Romans 1 through 3, specifically Romans 1 through 3, verse 20, Paul is making a case for the gospel. He's basically, in, in chapters 1, 2, and 3, he's telling us about our dreadful condition, right? He says that, like he just told us, for all of sin and far short of the glory of God, he says that there is no one good, not even one. He goes on to say that our throats are like empty graves. And so Paul is just unpacking, just letting us know how awful we are apart from Christ and how sinful we are. But then, but then he gets to the good news of the gospel that we just read. He says, you may be helpless, but you're not hopeless. Like apart from Christ, we're completely helpless. There's no external goodness and behavior that I can do that's going to make me right before God. But then in steps Jesus. That's the good news of the gospel. And so we see here is, but then Paul says in Romans 1.16, he says, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why is he not ashamed of the gospel? Well, because he says it is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. It is the power of salvation. Did you know that in scripture that Apart from Jesus in the Gospels himself, Jesus himself, the Gospel is the only thing referred to as the power of God. Now let that sink in for a minute. It's the only thing apart from Jesus Christ himself is referred to as that's the power of God. Like not creation, none of that. First Peter says that the angels look in and peer in are just amazed at what Jesus did in our place. Like Peter tells us, they can't wrap their minds around. It's not that they glory at creation. I mean, they were there. Like they, it's that God would send His Son to pay our penalty and sin dead in full. And right now, they're still trying to wrap their minds around it. 
And so Paul says, I'm not ashamed of that. He says, why? Because it is the power of God for salvation. And so, listen, Paul didn't say it contains the power of God. He didn't say the gospel is, it it channels the power of God. What did he say? He said, it is the power of God. And so that means something for us. Like, that's the power of God, the gospel, us as a church. We want to take the gospel to our neighbors and the nations. What we're taking them then is the power of God. Right? And so, so the gospel is the power of God. And listen, wouldn't it be wise to place it above everything else? Like if, we're, if, if we want to move forward as a church, wouldn't it be wise that we place the gospel above all? Because Paul gives us a pretty good case and if right logic will lead us to do what? Place the gospel above anything. Above my preferences. Above anything. Why? Because Paul said that and that alone is the power of God for salvation. And so we should let it drive everything we do as a church. And then and then we get to Romans 3, it says, it's the power of God. Here's how it's the power of God. All right, what we just read. And so after describing uh, humanity's dreadful condition, Paul gives us a glorious hope. Listen, God has done something on, on behalf of sinners. He has intervened to rescue us from the wrath to come. That's what Jesus has done. Listen, the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus does what? It changes everything. It changes their... It's the greatest game changer. Right? The gospel, the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus is the greatest game changer. I mean, think of it this way. Think, uh, imagine playing... Go back to those days where, I don't know, you're, you're playing a sport that you enjoy. Maybe it's... Uh, baseball or softball or football, right? But we're going to stick with football. Um, and so imagine you're, you're playing football and your team's just horrible, right? Like your, your, team's, your team's awful. I'm sorry, Garen. It's probably Tennessee. But then, speaking of Tennessee, your team's horrible. And you're like looking at each other. Guys, what are we going to do? And then in steps Peyton Manning. And you're like, oh, we just... I think we just got a little better. No, we actually got a lot better. Like the sheriff just showed up. And so Peyton Manning comes on our team. And so our team was awful. But now, listen, we have hope. But now we have victory. Right? Because we, we were once horrible and awful. But then here comes somebody who's better than us, stronger than us. He comes in and now we have hope, right? Now we have victory. But listen, on a much greater, more important way, Jesus has changed the game for us. He's changed the game for us. We, we were helpless, loser sinners. Now we're hopeful, victorious trophies of God's grace. <laughs> that's the game changer. That's the gospel. And so that's what we want to pick up and take with us. And so Paul gives us what this looks like. And so there's just one point today, and we'll get out of here. Like This is what I want you to leave with. And what Paul has told us here is that faith in Jesus' sacrifice in my place releases me from the penalty of sin. That's good news. Releases me from the penalty of sin. Faith in what? In Jesus' sacrifice. What does it do? Releases me from the penalty of sin. So you can say this. We can say, we can sum up the gospel in just four words. Jesus in my place. I mean, Paul just spoke about, he, I mean, just so many wonderful, beautiful words to describe the gospel. But one of the things that he described was Jesus in my place, the atoning sacrifice. So basically, the definition of Jesus in my place today, it highlights what? Jesus' substitutional death in your place. And so the Bible mentions Jesus' substitutional death as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Atoning sacrifice. So when we think about the word atoning, right? In verse 25, it says God presented him as an atoning sacrifice in his blood. He says, received through faith, demonstrated through righteousness. Because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. And so we can say it this way. An atoning sacrifice means that God poured out on Jesus the righteous anger he had toward you and me. So the word... In Greek, atoning means to satisfy. And so when you think about it, what Paul is saying is, Jesus' substitutionary death in your place satisfied the wrath of God towards sin. 
And so Paul goes on to say, though, that, that he died. Listen, he died the death you were condemned to die. His obedience covers what you couldn't and, and didn't do. You see, Jesus' reward comes to you, but your punishment goes to him. That's the atonement. That's the atoning sacrifice that, that Paul is talking about here. But why? Why did, why did Jesus have to die in my place? Like, what? what's the deal with that? Like, why did he have to be the atoning sacrifice to satisfy God's wrath in my place? Well, Paul tells us in Romans what? Romans 3, 23, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we know this to be true, too. Later on, Paul says in Romans 6, 23, that what? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, Jesus' death was paying the penalty of your sin. What's the penalty of our sin? Death. Bloodshed. Hebrews 9.22 says, according to the law, almost everything is purified with blood. But then he goes on to say, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There is no forgiveness. There's none. Uh, David in Psalms 51 says that the, the blood of lambs and the blood of animals cannot take away our sin. So apart from Jesus, we're stuck. We're helpless. And apart from Jesus, we're also hopeless. And so he goes on to say, though, that Jesus was the atoning sacrifice for us. And so here's what that means, church. On the cross, Jesus was not just showing us God's love. Like what drove, what drove Jesus to the cross? Yes, that God loves us. And I think the cross is the greatest depiction of just how much your Father in heaven loves you. Like if you ever doubt that, look to the cross. Like if you ever start feeling, ugh, I don't really know him. Does he love me, someone like me? Because I know me, and I know he sees me. And then you just look to the cross, you're like, oh, yes, he does. Thank God. Jesus in my place. But, but it wasn't just him showing us how much God loves us. Listen, this is what makes the gospel so beautiful. And this is, if you were to root your life in this, it'll change you. So we have to look a l- little bit past just God showing us how much he loves us. And we have to look at the punishment that Jesus endured. You see, the cross, it was Jesus. It was, Jesus was taking the place of our punishment. And so we can say it this way. Jesus just didn't die for us. Jesus died instead of us. Think of it that way. Think when you, when you take the gospel and you just look at it in all its different forms. Yes, God loves you and the cross is the greatest demonstration of that. But if you, if you go a little bit deeper and you, you dig a little bit deeper. And listen, that's why we say here... That the gospel isn't just the entry door to Christianity. Listen, the gospel is, the beauty of the gospel is endless because the beauty of God is endless. And so you just keep, it's kind of like, um, I think during my lifetime, the greatest Batman is uh, Batman Returns. All right, you got Bruce Wayne, and we know the story. I mean, in every Batman, I think it, it shows his his backstory and I'm like oh I know this already I've seen 15 of them like I know what happens but then you know when Batman returns he sees the the well and he, he sees it and then he falls into it right and he's lived there at Wayne family estate all his life but then he goes down into this well and and then he eventually gets the courage to go deeper. And he, as he goes deeper, he begins to explore and he begins to see more and more things. And he begins to realize more and more things. Listen, the gospel is the same way. The, the deeper you go into it and, and you look at it in different ways, you just begin to explore. God is so good. And so when we look at it on the outside, it's God was dying for me. Yes, that is true. But you look at it as a sinner and the punishment didn't fall on you, but it fell on Jesus and he's your substitute. Jesus in my place releases me from the penalty of sin. Then you look at it from the the angle of he died not just for me, but instead of me. Thank you, God. Jesus in my place. And not just dying for me, but instead of me. Not just dying for you, but instead of you. And so that's what Paul is meaning with the atoning sacrifice. You see, the sins, when he talks about they passed over, God just passed over them in the Old Testament. Remember, like David says, the the lambs, they don't remove the guilt of sin. You see, in the Old Testament, sins in the Old Testament, saints had never fully been atoned or resolved. 
right? They had only been passed over, Paul says. And so because, listen, the lambs they sacrificed couldn't actually pay for sin. They were only symbols of what Jesus would do. The lambs that they would sacrifice every year and it would go into the Holy of Holies and the priest would go in and he would make sacrifices or atonement for the people, right? But the writer, David tells us in Psalms 51 that they were just a symbol of what was to come. It took a perfect man living the life we were supposed to live and dying in our place to pay for our sins. And so in other words, listen, although the Old Testament, God forgave people's sins on credit. It's kind of like running up the bill on a credit card. You just keep running it up and eventually what's going to happen? Hey, Mr. Lott, let me just talk to you about your credit card bill. It's due. And so eventually, credit was due. But then Jesus came and paid the sin debt in full. He, he was the perfect man who didn't just die for you, but died instead of you. He didn't just die for me, but died instead of me. And so faith in Jesus' to sacrifice in my place releases me from the penalty of sin. So you know what that means? Paul tells us. He says, in verse 24, he says, They are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say in verse 26, God presented Him to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time. So that what? So that we would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. And so we got the substitutional death. Jesus not just dying for me, but instead of me. Jesus in my place. It's good news. Right? He was punished. He took my punishment. And I got his reward. That's what, that's what uh, theologians say, the great exchange that took place on the cross. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. He became sin. Right, who knew no sin, so that we might become what? The righteousness of God. He became so that we could become. Guys, thank you. So in my place, he became so that we could become. So what does that mean? You know what that means? That means that not in your own good efforts and your own good works, you are declared legally right and just before God. That if you were in the courtroom, right, the, the guilty declared not guilty. That's beautiful. The guilty declared not guilty. And so here's what, what that means. So justify. He says, Paul uses the word justify to explain what happens to us when we trust in Jesus' atoning sacrifice. So when we trust in the substitutionary death of Jesus, Jesus in my place, I trust in that. Right? I, don't, I, don't, I don't try to justify myself, but I, I place my full weight on what Jesus did for me. I recognize that I was helpless, but because of Jesus, I am not hopeless. And so I place all my weight on what he did in my place. And so Paul says, when that happens, you are in a moment justified and declared right before God. I love what, how Rang, Wayne Grudem defines justification this way. He says justification, it's a big word, listen, don't be intimidated by it. Justification is an instantaneous legal act of God in which, one, he thinks of our sins as forgiven and Christ's righteousness as belonging to us. So, he, so for the first thing, justification means that our sins are forgiven and then Christ's righteousness belongs to us. Right? He takes my sin and then I receive his righteousness. And then secondly, Grudem says that justification declares us to be righteous in his sight. So here's what that means. So God, our judge, we will sit before him one day. And because of our faith in Jesus' substitutionary death in us, he declares us only those in Christ to be made right. To be made right. And listen, here's the good news of that. Right? Jesus' substitutionary death, what does it do? It justifies me before God. I have what? I Sorry, Siri. I have a... Forgive, I've been forgiven, and then Christ's righteousness now belongs to you and me. That's beautiful. And so here's the good news of the gospel is you can't justify yourself. We can't. You and I, we cannot justify ourselves, Paul said. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. So here's the good news. 
is you can't justify yourself because Paul tells us in Romans 3, 1 through 20, right, that we can't do enough good works to justify ourselves before a holy God. We just can't. We can't do it. We fall short. What did Paul say? We, we fall short. We miss the mark. Justifying is when we try to shoot the arrow to hit the mark, but then we draw a circle around where our, where our arrow fell. And we say, well, I'm not as bad as they are, right? Like, I do, I do good stuff. That's not going to be enough. Why? For the penalty of sin. And so we're, we're sinful. We all fall short. So we need somebody in our place who doesn't fall short and lives up to the glory of God perfectly. And Jesus was that for you. Not just for you, but instead of you. And so then Paul tells us we've been justified. And so, But the, the thing is about it, we can't justify ourselves. You know, when you go to the amusement park, I mean, we go with Jace and we always pray. We're like, man, please let Jace feel on this roller coaster because, man, he gets bummed out if he can't. And we're like sticking tissue paper in his shoe, you know, so he can just get a little, a little taller. And, and so you go up to the, to the measuring stick and you see normally it's like 42 inches and he's just right there. And sometimes he'll just like stand on his tippy toes as tall as he can. And sometimes he just doesn't measure up. Listen, we can't. One day we're going to have to stand before that measuring stick. And listen, you and I are not the measuring stick. God himself is the measuring stick. The people sitting right next to you, from the left to the right, in front of you and behind you, they're not your measuring stick. Your family, your parents, they're not your measuring stick. God himself is the measuring stick. And then when it becomes time at the end of our life to stand up against that measuring stick, can I tell you, friends, we're going to fall short apart from Jesus. And so you know what we do? We place all our weight on what Jesus did for us. We, we declare and we, as Paul says, we boast in the gospel, I am helpless. I'm helpless. Apart from Jesus, I'm helpless. But thank God I'm not hopeless. Thank God that he died instead of me and took my punishment so that I could get his reward. And it's not based on any good thing that I've done or will do. It's solely based on the good works of Christ. And so Paul says, we, we are not counted as righteous according to the law anymore. Listen, in the Old Testament, you know what the law was good for? It just revealed, it magnified the issue that we knew was there, that we can't obey God. It, I told the Wednesday night crew that Jesus says in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, he said that, he said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Wow. But you know what type of righteousness the scribes and the Pharisees had? It was only external. And the, the exceeding righteousness that Jesus is looking for is internal. We can't produce internal righteousness because what's inside of us is the op is unrighteous. And so we need someone to take our place and free us from the penalty of our sin. And Jesus is that person. He's the one that makes us right before God. You and I do not. We cannot. And so Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. They had an external righteousness, not an internal one. But faith in Jesus justifies us. Right? It declares us righteous before him. And can I tell you, here's the question I get asked a lot when I'm talking to people about the gospel and about the end of their life. Man, you, you bring up eternity, like you bring up the end of someone's life, they lean in a little bit. That's, that's what we're, that's, we're all afraid of. That's, that's man's worst fear. And, and, but Hebrew tells us that Jesus came to free us from the fear of death. But you, you, start, you start talking about that and you start pushing those buttons, this is the thing that we get asked constantly. Well, how do I know I've been a good enough person? How do I know I've done good enough things? How do I know that? Listen, you've... Maybe from the world standards, we, we've been a great person, yes, but God's standard isn't our good behavior or church attendance. Listen, it's His standard. He's the standard Himself. But the good news in verse 24 says is that our good news that promises we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The guilty declared not guilty. And listen, you being right before God by faith in Christ does not happen over time. That's sanctification. You being made right in a moment, placing your faith in Him is, is instantaneous. It's a moment. It's, as the Bible would say, it's imputed. It's putting into your account in a moment. 
You don't grow in righteousness. You don't become more righteous. You place your faith in the substitutionary death of Jesus. And in that moment, when you place all your faith and all your weight on him, God declares you right with him. So we don't, we don't spend our life trying to moral conformity, where we try to just do good things, and maybe I'm good today, and maybe God has seen me as righteous, and then at the end of my life, maybe all that will stack up. And when I stand the measuring stick, it'll be enough. Friends, that's, that's exhausting and that's tiring. That's not what Jesus came to do for us. Jesus also said in Matthew 5, he says that I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. He said I came to fulfill them. The law and the prophets is the Old Testament. He came to fulfill those, friends. Listen, the law was like an MRI. It showed us that we were broken. It revealed that we're fallen. It reveals that we're sinful. But when you go get an x-ray, what's the x-ray? It's just going to reveal a broken bone, right? You know what the x-ray is incapable of doing? Fixing the broken bone. The law, our good, it just reveals that we're broken. But it can't fix us. And so Jesus said, I don't, I'm not abolishing that. He said, but I come to fulfill it on your behalf. And so Jesus comes and and he fulfills what we couldn't do. He he becomes the perfect substitute. And we place all our weight and faith in him. And in a moment, Paul says that you're justified before him. We don't spend our life trying to justify ourselves. Listen, you can either justify yourself or you can allow Jesus to justify you. And can I tell you, he's the best defense attorney in the world. In the galaxy. So I would, I would have rather let Jesus do that than me try to justify myself. But here's what you have to admit, church. You have to admit that I'm helpless. And we don't, we don't like that, do we? we? We like to feel like, man, I got something in me. Right? I, I got, I'm not completely helpless. No, apart from Jesus, the Bible says we are. But the good news is we are not hopeless. We have a perfect Savior who loved us all the way to the cross, gave his life. The the wood that he created, I love what Matt Chandler says, the wood that he created, the metal that he fashioned was pierced through his hands. And the wood that he created, he was placed upon. His beard was ripped out and he was spit upon for you. And so we just, what we do here today, listen, you place all your, you build your life in that. Not in, not in trying, listen, I am convinced that people do not walk away from Jesus. They walk away from trying to be a good person. The, 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 the mass exodus we see in the church today has not been because people have tried Jesus. It's because they tried being a good person. And they just can't do it. You and I, we can't do it. But man, when you just go all in on Jesus and you say, you know what? Yes, I'm helpless. And so Jesus, I need what you did for me. I can't be good enough, and I never will be. But you were, and you are even still, and so I place my weight. Paul says in in the same section of Scripture, he says that we are justified through faith in Jesus Christ. Listen, not faith in something else, not faith plus good words. It's faith in Jesus. It's leaning and putting all your weight on Him. And so this morning, that's... De- guilty, declared not guilty. And so we can stand as righteous before God because Jesus stood in my place. I can stand as righteous before God, not because I'm a good person or because I do good things. Maybe in the world standard, yes. But when it comes to measuring up to God's standard himself, we fall short, you and I do. But the good news is we, we have a person who stood in our place. And so Paul says, Paul says, listen, where this begins, the substitution, and then we place our faith in Jesus, what he did for us, we're declared justified before God. We don't have to spend our life trying to justify ourselves. We let him change us from the inside in. And listen, inside out. This is, this is how we change. Right? We, we, we are transformed by placing faith in Jesus. Right? Listen, that's why up here you're never going to get seven steps to a healthy marriage. Because we believe what you need most for a struggling marriage is not self-help. What you need 
is for you and your spouse to gaze upon the beauty of Jesus in the gospel. Like parents, I don't need 10 steps to being a good parent. What I need is to parent my kids in the gospel. I need to root my life in the gospel. And what's the gospel? Jesus in my place. Because what if I do those seven steps to a healthy marriage and we're still struggling, right? What what if I do those 10 steps to a better parent and I still struggle? The gospel says, look, we're not going to hit the mark. But Jesus did in our behalf, and so we place our faith in him, and then there's grace to carry us along the way. Grace is for the journey, right? And so we're declared right before him. We're declared right before him. Listen, faith in Jesus declares us right before him. Justifies you. Right legal standing before God. It's not in your doing. It's in Jesus' doing on your behalf. He didn't just die for you. He died instead of you. Would you bow your head just for a moment? Everybody, head bowed. I just want to ask you a few questions, and I I want you to ponder on these. Do you put more stake in trying to be a better person than you do in trusting in the person of Jesus? That's something we have to ponder. I think we carry the weight of trying to be that, that perfect person, perfect spouse, perfect parent. But listen, we're, we're going to fall short. But the Bible gives us a better word. It says Jesus was punished in our place. And so maybe you're here today and, man, you, you have just never heard that, that he wasn't just did die for you, but he died instead of you. And that means that If he died instead of me, that means that I'm the reason he went to the cross because I'm the one with sin. And so today, I just want to ask you, have you placed, declared that? I am helpless apart from Jesus, but Jesus is so good that he took my place. And so now I I get it. I got to, I got to repent of my sin and trust in Jesus for salvation. And if that's you, I would ask you to come talk to Garrett and I. Listen, we can't run the rat race of trying to be a good person. It's just a hamster wheel of exhaustion. So here's what we do today. We place all our faith in Jesus and let him justify us. We can't justify ourselves. And so, Father, would you do a work this morning? Would you do deep work for us? Would you remind us of the good good things of the gospel, that Jesus didn't just die for us, but he died instead of us, that you sent your son, that you're a just God. Sin had to be paid for, God. It had to be. But you sent your son to pay for it and not us. He was punished, but we received his reward. And so, Lord, would that just settle in someone's heart today? That they are declared righteous, justified in a moment. And so, God, we we just celebrate the fact that Jesus did what we couldn't do. Father, do a work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.